Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to talk about mutexes and how they relate to the memory model. Memory model to mutexes. In our previous two videos, we have explored the memory model and atomic data types. We suggest watching these before proceeding so you have the full picture. As we continue on, we are bringing mutexes and locks into the mix. The C++ memory model makes certain guarantees, and we want to discuss how these affect the behavior of a multi-threaded program. As we often do, we will start with definitions to ensure the basics are well established. Then we can look at some example source code to show how mutexes and locks can be used. In the last part, we want to consider if there is a way to improve how we are using mutexes. The C++ memory model defines a lot of different terms. The one we need for this discussion is called happens before. This sounds pretty simple, however it is actually more complex than you might expect. The idea of happens before is about actions occurring in two different threads. We want to know does this operation in thread A happen before that operation in thread B? The question of happens before is not the same thing as sequenced before. The definition of sequencing deals with expressions which are evaluated inside one single thread and the ordering relationship between those operations. In contrast, happens before is about synchronizing operations between different threads. If there are operations in different threads which do have a happens-before relationship, these operations are considered synchronized. If there is no happens-before relationship, these operations are called unsynchronized. If you have a race condition in your code, it is most likely caused by unsynchronized operations. The C++ committee recognized there needed to be a way for a programmer to indicate that a section of code run by multiple threads at the same time would cause problems. The threads would interfere with each other and produce meaningless or random results. The purpose of a mutex is to guarantee exclusive access to a designated section of code. Suppose thread A executes a section of code with exclusive access. Then thread B runs this same region of code. In order for thread B to observe all the modifications produced by thread A, there had to be rules set up to avoid the possibility of interleaving the execution of this code between threads. This is where the idea of happens before comes in. Using a mutex to assure exclusive access to code is more restrictive than the atomic operations we discussed in our previous video. Atomics can only guarantee that a single memory operation is not interleaved with another thread doing a read or write on the same data. A lock is an abstraction which designates a shared resource or some region of code can only be run by one thread at a time. While this thread is running the code, it has exclusive access and the code is considered in use. Every other thread must wait their turn to run this code, and each time it is run, the given thread will have exclusive access. In C++, locks are implemented as a method of a mutex class. Keep in mind, the purpose of doing this is to avoid a race condition which according to the C++ standard, can produce undefined behavior. A mutex object must provide the methods lock and unlock. The lock method must ensure the given mutex object can only be locked one time and other attempts to lock are blocked. So the only thing that actually happens by calling lock is that the mutex object state is changed. The thread which applied for a lock on the mutex object is responsible for eventually calling unlock when it has completed its work. 
it is important to understand that locking a mutex object does not physically protect the given resource or section of code. It is an arbitrary lock on an object which has no real association to the code it is actually intended to protect. Locking a mutex should be used only when necessary and for the shortest time possible. There are ways to mess this up. For example, locking two mutexes in a different order. When locking and unlocking a mutex is done correctly, the memory model provides a guarantee. For a given mutex, every unlock will happen before the next lock. According to the standard, every thread is guaranteed to see a consistent view of the results produced by the previous thread. There are several mutex classes in the C++ standard, and these are the most commonly used. There are a few others, which are simply combinations of the ones listed here. The most common class is std mutex, which only provides three methods. In addition to lock and unlock, there is also the trilock method. This allows a thread to request a lock without the possibility of waiting or being blocked. If the mutex is available, the trilock will return true and lock the mutex object. If the mutex is in use, then trilock will immediately return with a result of false. The recursive mutex class provides a mutex object with the ability to be locked multiple times, but only by the same thread. This can be useful when multiple functions need to lock the same mutex. The class timed mutex adds methods named trylock4 and trylock until, which allow specifying a timeout parameter. These methods will wait for up to the specified amount of time to check if the mutex object becomes available. If the time elapses and the lock still could not be obtained, the call will fail. The methods lock shared and unlock shared are the main reason to use the shared mutex class, which was added in C17. The lock shared method allows any number of threads to lock the mutex object. Since this method does not grant exclusive use, it should only be used when the code in question does not change any data. Most likely there will be some other section of code that does a traditional lock call and it may need to wait until all readers have completed. In this first example, we are declaring a file local static mutex object. It is also common for the mutex object to be a class data member, or occasionally a global variable. In the function thing1, we call lock, do something, and then at the end call unlock. It is important to observe that the exact same mutex object needs to be visible in thing1, no matter which thread calls this function. If some mutex were declared locally in thing1, then every call to this function would be locking a different mutex. This defeats the purpose, and the call to lock would have zero effect. There is, however, a serious problem with this code. If any statement in the body might throw an exception or return early, the mutex will not be unlocked. So let's look at an example of a better way to do this which is more reliable and less error-prone. The best way to ensure the unlock method is called every time it would be required is to find a way not to need it. The solution is to use a different class which will take responsibility for calling lock and unlock. The lock guard class was designed just for this purpose. The constructor of lock guard does the call to lock. If another thread is executing this code and the mutex object is already locked, the constructor will wait indefinitely until the other thread releases the lock. When a thread exits this code, the destructor of lock guard is responsible for removing the lock and restoring the state of the mutex object. If waiting indefinitely for the lock is not something your application can tolerate, there are classes which may provide a better solution. The std unique lock class has a second parameter, which can be passed to the constructor. 
If you pass the value, try to lock, the constructor will attempt to acquire the lock, but fail immediately if the mutex is already locked. If you use this approach, make sure to check whether the lock was successfully acquired. This is done by calling the ownsLock method. Of course, your code will need to handle what to do if acquiring the lock fails, which could lead to many other design decisions. The final lock class we want to show is STD Scoped Lock. This is a relatively new class, which was added in C17. The constructor is variadic and accepts any number of mutex objects, which can be locked as one operation. The reason you may want to lock multiple mutexes at the same time is that the constructor of the scope lock class automatically ensures multiple mutex objects are locked and unlocked in an order which does not cause a deadlock. In these examples, we have shown several different ways to lock a given mutex object to protect code or a shared resource. The objective has been to ensure only one thread at a time can access the code or some piece of data. Taking a step back, there is an obvious problem which is often overlooked. We create a mutex with a random variable name, then we lock it and we use another random variable name. There is nothing which associates the shared resource or data with the mutex and the lock. This puzzled us and we decided there had to be a better way to link the mutex and the lock with the data it is protecting. So yes, there are improvements we can make. And in our next video, we are going to show several examples of exactly how to do this. For more information about Copper Spice, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in a few weeks for our next video.